Hi, my name is Vibhi Kant and I'm a product manager at Facebook. Um, I'm going to share my learnings that I've had as a PM at Facebook and at Amazon in the next few minutes about how we can build uh, really high performing rockstar product teams. Before we get into that, let me give you a brief uh, overview about myself. So very long time ago, after my electrical engineering, I started as a programmer and I programmed in assembly language in COBOL, uh, which nobody actually programs in, I think, right now. Uh, then I came here for work, went to business school at UNC, got my MBA. After my MBA, I went to Amazon and that was my first job as a product manager. I stumbled into it by accident. And uh, since then, I've been a product manager. I love being a product manager. So I worked at Amazon for two and a half years, then came to the Bay Area from Seattle and worked for a startup for a year and a half. I came to Facebook um, about five and a half years ago in 2015. And I've been here since. Uh, Facebook is the company that I've worked longest. I started as the product manager on newsfeed ranking in the newsfeed org. Then I worked in the artificial intelligence org uh, in a team that operates at the intersection of ethics and AI. And now I am in Messenger and I work on uh, um, video and audio quality work. So this is my intro. Uh, let's get into, you know, what are the learnings uh, I've had and uh, how you can leverage those learnings to build rockstar product teams uh, in your own companies and places. Um, Let's first start with what are the characteristics of a rockstar team? I think we use uh, rockstar a lot, but it is good to just define what it means. The first and the most important characteristic of this team is that instead of operating as uh, individual members, it operates as one efficient unit. And this is incredibly important that the entire team actually operates as one efficient unit. This is kind of the North Star and the driving goal that we should strive towards as a PM where the team should go. Uh, obviously, you know, the team has high velocity, but it does not come at the cost of high quality work. So both are delivered high velocity and high quality. It can change direction pretty quick, depending on what are the company needs and how does the business situation change. It delivers beyond expectations. Uh, and it uh, is a happy from inside team. This is a joke uh, from my previous team. Basically, the gist is that, you know, the, the people have good camaraderie with each other. They enjoy working with each other. They love solving the problems that they're working on and in general are in a good mood and a happy mood when they come to work on Monday. Uh, so that is a happy from inside team. So how do we get there? Um, there are three key things to getting here and we'll start with the first one. Um, we need to create as PMs a shared sense of purpose. And this obviously in a very practical way starts with goals. Now, a lot you know, has been written and said about goals. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of details about how to pick a certain goal, but there are a few things that I've observed that you know, if not done well, they can completely misalign the team and cause a lot of thrash. So first thing is have the team goals aligned with org goals, whatever is your business org goals as much as possible. Um, it is not always possible, I understand that. And so in the cases that it's not possible, try to have a very clear articulation of how this proxy goal that you have uh, or the intermediate metric that you have, it contributes to the org goal. And it is really, really important that you do invest the time and effort here. Um, to the extent possible, have you know, only one goal. Sometimes it's not possible, depending on you know, how many things your team oversees, what are the areas. So have very few goals, maybe not more than two or three goals. Um, and I learned this the hard way. You know, at one point in one of the teams that I was starting at, we had six goals and it was crazy. Nobody understood what we were doing, why we were doing it. And uh, a big part of it was we just had too many things, too many goals that we were trying to move. So have fewer goals. If you have more than one goal, then 
if there are any trade-offs between different goals, make sure you understand it and you articulate it upfront. So if you are going to move X, but somehow it you know, drives down Y, make sure you articulate that and make sure you have some sense of priority, which goal is the really the most important goal uh, and then which can be the subsequent goals. Um, by corollary, I think it is also important to have what you are not going to take on as goals. Sometimes you don't have to do it. It's better to do it more often than not because uh, especially from a leadership point of view, a lot of times they may think that, oh, this is already covered in this particular goal. So why didn't we actually like improve that particular thing? Uh, so when you clearly articulate a non-goal, it uh, just provides a very clear boundary and an operating space for the team and makes it very clear to the leadership what uh, boundaries you're operating in. So they can either object or agree at the very upfront about it. So the clarity helps. The second um, thing here is, and this is the biggest and the most important uh, thing that you will work on throughout uh, with your team. It is creating a sense of belonging and a sense of worth for your team. In essence, you, this is about creating a culture within your team so that they can unlock their potential, they can work very well together and then deliver the results that they are, you are expecting them to deliver. There are four uh, key pieces to it. So I'll go into a little bit more detail of all those four pieces. Again, as a reminder, I'm not gonna go into like very detailed things. This is more practically a tip sheet for what I have seen work extremely well, but better than other things that I've tried. And so I've distilled all of that here in the deck. The first uh, is obvious. I think everything starts with building trust and respect within the different team members. We are all peers. Um, so how can you do that? There are a lot of you know, things out there. You can do team building exercises and bunch of other things. The things that I have seen work very, very well um, given the budget constraints or now in COVID, like how to do even team activities constraints. Um, getting to know the people, finding informal avenues of knowing them. Um, the highest uh, ROI thing that we found was a weekly team lunch when, you know, this is pre-COVID era, obviously, um, where every Thursday, you know, we would just make sure that we cleared our calendars and uh, all of us, we sat down and have lunch. And the only rule was that we will not talk about work. Uh, which meant that we talked about work only 20% of the time. Uh, the rest 80% we didn't. And it was fascinating, uh, you know, to get to know the people as people, not just, you know, as an engineer or as a DS. Um, the next one is uh, communicating openly and respectfully. Um, uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, other things you can do here. I am uh, stating the two that I have seen like uh, people often overlooking and that leads to a lot of problems. First is always communicate in the language that is common to all the team members. Um, you know, we all work in Silicon Valley. Um, at least I work in Silicon Valley and uh, uh, you know, the composition of engineering teams is uh, sometimes uh, uniform in terms of nationality or in terms of uh, uh, any other aspects such as language. So we, it's easy to forget and switch into the local language, but please ensure, you know, that you talk in the common language. It encourages participation from everyone. The second one is uh, to the extent that your team writes documents or any written communication, make sure by default it is in the shared mode. Uh, one tendency I've seen is that a lot of people, especially DS, data scientists and engineers, they like to have a private document before it is ready to be shared. Um, but, you know, it is important that within the team, they feel safe that they can have a draft version of the document. They can put the word draft and then um, they actually start from a shared document rather than a private document. Um, the next one is enabling uh, um, collaboration and participation and the PM has a outsized role in enabling this. Uh, there are few things here, so we'll go one by one. Uh, the first one we've already talked about, which is you know building trust and respect and building a camaraderie amongst the team members. The second one is um, be very inclusive in your meetings and brainstorms. Um, 
try different formats. And the reason for saying this is, uh, you know, you typically we do brainstorms when we are doing um, things such as setting roadmaps or setting debating strategy or direction uh, for the coming whatever planning period your company is on. And um, it is very easy to forget people who don't speak up um, because not everybody can speak up in the moment. So you have to recognize that uh, just because they can't speak up doesn't mean they don't have good ideas. So one thing that worked very well for me, um, you know, given that I work at Facebook and we use our own tools, it was that we did written brainstorms. So I would work with my data scientist and my engineering manager to come up with a set of, you know, uh, brainstorm questions. And then in the brainstorm meeting, I'll post the question and people will then input their ideas as comments um, in a document. And uh, once uh, that is done, you know, we'll have like three minutes per question or something to write down the comment. And then we go around the table where, uh, you know, people talk about their idea. And if they have more than one idea, they pick their best idea or an idea that has not been covered before. Uh, that way you get a little bit more detail into and you can ask follow up questions into like, what is the actual idea? And this uh, I have found of the different uh, you know formats of brainstorms that I've tried. This I have found to be the most engaging uh, and most fun. And so people get excited about actually brainstorms then and planning rather than you know feeling that oh it's a very dreary exercise. You know, again we are doing planning. The third is uh, recognize each other in uh, team forums. Um, a lot of times, you know, we help out each other. And uh, even though the motivation is not recognition for helping out, we should help out because we are working towards common goals and we work on a team. But uh, recognition of that effort that people put into helping each other out um, creates a good flywheel of, okay, this is valued. Um, it's not that, you know, I am doing this and it goes into an abyss and nobody recognizes this or sees me uh, helping out. So it's really, really important that, you know, you recognize each other's efforts and it'll help uh, the team move way faster, you know, when people are helping out each other. The next big piece is uh, meetings. As a team, we attend a lot of meetings. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on one particular meeting. Um, the weekly team meeting. If you don't have it, um, I highly encourage you to have it. Um, and this is, uh, I found the biggest lever for exchange of information, for uh, uh, communication, both uh, upwards as well as, you know, across on what we are doing and a good opportunity, a great opportunity for fostering collaboration. So the way we did these team meetings were um, before the meeting, I would, uh, or the meeting organizer would post the agenda, typically one day before. Um, I mean, we try for 24 hours, but, you know, uh, sometimes it's, you know, at night uh, and the meeting is again at 11 a.m. the next day, but that's fine. The point is that you have a cadence where agenda is always posted before. Um, team members post their updates for that agenda before they attend the meeting. And this is really, really important that the updates are posted in the meeting. Now, during the meeting, we don't go over the written updates because they are written and uh, you know everybody can read them. We don't need to discuss each detail of the written update. We focus on a few things. Uh, so first of all, like all functions and all team members discuss their work and put their updates. Second, instead of reading just the update that everybody has written, we discuss only the blockers or anything uh, that a particular person may need feedback on. Maybe they are working on a problem. Maybe they are stuck on some logging issue or maybe you know the design needs some feedback. So that is the thing that we focus on. Um, if there is any new body of work that we are starting, obviously the person who is starting it uh, prepares a little bit more. Uh, they have some sort of very lightweight, you know, document about or a presentation about what is the idea? Why is it important that we invest in it? What is the opportunity, et cetera, rough? We don't want like too much, you know, um, burden of, you know, buttoning up everything before they come to the team meeting uh, to get informal feedback from the team members. The last thing, and I'll touch upon this again in the next slide, um, as a PM, I don't run this meeting all the time. Each team member takes 
turn um, running the meeting. And what we made sure was that, you know, each team member has at least two weeks in a row running the meeting. Uh, there are a few benefits to it. First of all, they get vested into understanding what each team member is working on uh, because, you know, they have to follow up and ask questions and they have to moderate the meeting. The second is um, because after the meeting, we post the meeting notes. Um, they have to understand uh, the work area in order to post meaningful meeting notes. Um, it also makes the team members more confident in their communication, which is incredibly important uh, at all levels, not just at you know, presentation to leadership, for example, but just in communicating uh, more efficiently and quickly amongst each other also. Um, the last thing is obviously a very hygiene thing that everybody should do after the meeting, you know, post meeting notes with very clear next steps and action item owners. If there are any blockers, uh, you call them out specifically so that you can resolve it. This is the single biggest lever for creating execution hygiene in your team, especially if you work on multiple different things uh, within the team. Moving on to the next one. Um, this is uh, specifically, you know, as PMs, uh, I would say that don't be territorial. You have to let go of your ego or any other thing that will come before the team. So what do I mean by that? Um, few things. First one is uh, invite your key team members to leadership reviews. Um, it doesn't matter whether they are junior or senior. Um, if they are working and leading a particular stream of work, invite them to the leadership reviews. Um, they can hear the feedback firsthand and they have much more context. You don't have to translate it because you know there is always some loss in translation. Um, and consistently over time, as they keep on attending these reviews, they will have a very good sense of, you know, of the urgency of things, of the importance of things, uh, and the level of quality that is expected of the team. Um, the second is, uh, if you are presenting uh, an update to your leadership in any review, invite other people, your key stake, uh, key people who are working in 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 alongside you. For example, design or research or data science to speak alongside you. Now, this is a little scary. Uh, I initially thought that this will be kind of uh, messy because, you know, four people in a 30 minute transition uh, in a presentation and uh, each one of us will not have a good, you know, handoff, uh, the story will not be clear and the leadership will be confused. Uh, but actually what ended up uh, happening when we tried this was our decks and our presentations or documents that we were presenting became much tighter because it became obvious to us um, in the speaker transition, where were the gaps? And uh, it made us much, much, much stronger as a team and our work became more buttoned up as a result of that. Uh, the third one I already said, you know, you let your team members take turns to run it. I'm not gonna go over it again. Uh, and the last one is be transparent in communication over communicate rather than under communicate. Don't think from the point of view that, you know, there is value in holding up of information uh, to the extent you can share um, anything and everything that would be helpful. Of course, you know, um, you have to make somewhat of a judgment call too, but as a PM, I've learned that erring on the side of being more transparent always works better rather than holding information. And lastly, um, you know, as a PM and as a team, because, you know, you are solving incredibly hard problems, um, there are going to be discussions where, you know, there's just going to be different points of view and a lot of disagreements. Um, and don't be afraid of those discussions. Uh, don't try to solve those discussions by hierarchy or by saying, oh, because the CEO said so or because the VP said so. Have an honest uh, discussion based on logic and reasoning that why we are trying to do this. Um, and uh, especially if the team disagrees with you, it is incredibly important that you listen to them and you encourage, you know, them expressing their point of view to you so that you have a pulse on the team too. Um, having said this, let's move into um, a good segue, which is encouraging diversity of thought. Again, as I said, we are all solving incredibly difficult problems. Um, so your job as a PM 
is to be a platform for all voices. It is really important that all the different ideas are encouraged. And uh, if nobody is actually bringing a counter idea, you should be that dissenting voice. Now, of course, you know, for every single thing, you don't need this, but for key projects and key things that you are doing, um, it is incredibly important that you have looked at it from different points of view, no matter how contrarian those points of view are. Now, this is not about promoting conflict, um, though I think like uh, conflict gets a really bad name for unnecessary reason. Um, I think this is more about understanding for ourselves that have we evaluated this problem or this idea from every perspective that we could have? Have we considered all scenarios or not? And uh, so how do you go about doing that? So first of all, of course, you know, uh, this is only as good as people feeling free to speak up their mind. So when you see somebody expressing a contrarian point of view, make sure you, you know, encourage that you praise different points of view and perspectives in a team forum. You don't have to make a very big deal out of it, but just saying like, hey, that's a great perspective. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, uh, by the way, we did think about it and this is not, this is the reason why we are or we are not doing it, et cetera. Um, again, as I said, you know, if nobody is bringing it up as a PM, it is your imperative to bring up a different point of view. Encourage competing ideas, especially for complex things, you know, especially for key projects and key things. Um, celebrate failures. So when you have actually competing ideas, when you're exploring multiple ways of doing something, obviously few things will work out and the others will not, but make sure you have learning from those failures and celebrate them. If you don't do that, then people will be afraid eventually of, you know, uh, trying out different things because they know that, you know, failure is really penalized. Uh, and lastly, and this is very important, you have to trust each other when people bring up concerns. You have to basically, um, you should feel free to disagree about the idea, but the disagreement should never be about the capability of a person. So don't critique the, the person or their capability to do their job. Um, and the last one here is have fun, obviously, uh, you know, celebrate small wins and milestones. So what we did in our team was every half at the end of the half, you know, we will have a big cake celebrating. It doesn't matter whether we missed our goals or not. If we um, met our goals, if we partially met our goals, we'll have a cake. It just never happened that we never uh, met our goals. We always met our goals, but even then, and even smaller, we used to have t-shirts and uh, um, uh, a team uh, logo uh, design competition. Um, anytime, you know, we got, uh, we had a particularly critical VP, uh, anytime we got a good job email from him, we used to celebrate uh, with, by just ordering some boba tea or, you know, just getting something from the micro kitchen and celebrating together. Uh, humor goes a very long way, but please be mindful of different cultures and, uh, you know, different perspectives. Uh, but in general, you know, humor is a great way of having fun on an everyday basis. Um, the third bit of this is, um, you know, you create a shared purpose, you are working constantly on improving execution. Uh, it is also worthwhile to keep on assessing, you know, whether you are on the right track or not, uh, because you want to drive continuous improvement. So how can we do that? Uh, three aspects to it. First is obviously you have to retrospect and you have to revisit what you're doing and see whether it's working or not. Um, so you can do informal feedback gathering in one-on-ones and team outings, anonymous survey. I've tried everything. Uh, each one of them has some value. One thing that in particular like works, worked out really well uh, was having a very structured retrospection. So I've included a sample of uh, what I had done in one of my previous teams. So it was very, very simple. Um, you know, in a team meeting, what we did was uh, I made three smiley faces uh, so the smile, happy faces for things that we are as a team doing well and we think are going well. Uh, sad one is obviously things that require attention and improvement. And the middle one, the meh one, is uh, where, you know, we 
not sure whether it's a very big problem or not, but it could become a potential problem. So we need to actually think about uh, how to address it in, uh, you know, short to medium term. And so the process was very simple, you know, for the first 10 or 15 minutes, everybody just takes a pen and writes, um, you know, in, um, in all these three buckets, certain things that are on their mind. Uh, we don't like uh, specifically ask people to put their names because uh, it's less about, you know, who is having this concern, but more that, okay, if one person has this concern, it's on the team, then it's important enough to discuss. And then we vote. Um, so the voting is just to ensure that we discuss, we get a sense of what is the most important thing on a bunch of team members' minds and that we address and solve for that. Um, and then we discuss each of the three buckets. It's very important that you discuss also what you are doing well or in the happy bucket, because a lot of times we forget to learn from what has worked well. Um, so this is, uh, this is something that, um, half over half we did with our team and eventually it became so successful that the VP of our org actually requested all the teams to do this. Uh, we did this once every six months, uh, but you can obviously, depending on um, your planning cycle and you know how uh, your company or your team operates, you can choose uh, to do it. Uh, don't do it, you know, once a year or once every month because then it loses the value and it becomes a distraction if you do it too often. And then once a year is just too long a time period for recalling everything and a lot can change in a year. So we found actually like by trial and error six months, but, you know, once a quarter is also fine, for example. Um as part of all the retrospection we did, uh, we could identify what's working well, and then uh, we could also figure out whatever areas of improvement were. On the working well side, a lot of times, uh, one thing uh, that we constantly were adjusting, especially my engineering manager and I were, do we have the right people on the right projects and in the right roles? Um, this is important because uh, you know leveraging people for their strengths is way more uh, impactful and productive rather than figuring out, okay, what is their weakness and should we try and fix that weakness to a point uh, that it becomes their strength? Of course, we need to manage the weaknesses, sure, but uh, we don't have to over pivot on that. Um, as a team, we invested a lot of effort in tooling and documentation um, because uh, even though in the short term, it was a time investment, uh, as more and more people joined the team, as the team expanded, or even if we had to go back to the same uh, set of things uh, six months down the line, we actually, because of the documentation and the tooling, uh, we could understand like why we decided to do certain things, why these deci decisions were made, or um, the investment in tooling like made us uh, move way faster. Uh, because we could, for example, debug way faster or do certain things way faster. Um, the third thing is obviously out of retrospection, you know, we discuss specific actions that uh, we need to take in order to fix certain things. Uh, um, here, one, one thing to note is that a lot of times, a lot of issues can be fixed within the team. And so that is what we did. But it is not always possible um, that uh, you get the, you are able to fix those issues. So, for example, one of the issues we uncovered were that we are having too many direction changes, which means that we have had to pivot to uh, different goals too often, which was causing a lot of trash. So this brings me to the next point. Don't be afraid for asking for help from your leaders. And this is not about complaining. This is just being very, very factual and pragmatic and respectful uh, about what you are learning from the ground, uh, from the people who are working on the ground and making sure that uh, the leaders in your org have heard that feedback. Um, and there are a few ways of doing it. Obviously, you know, you should definitely document, you know, um, the process of gathering the feedback, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's a retrospection. Um, demonstrate you know very clearly like hey these are the things that the team is working on fixing uh, so that they understand the full gamut of problems uh, that uh, we are trying to improve on but also then you can then highlight you know where you need help from the senior people or senior leaders in your org in order to fix those issues 
definitely share why those is- issues matter or how it impacts the team, how it slows them down so that they have an understanding, a very clear understanding of uh, why it is valuable. And needless to say, be very factual about it. Don't be accusatory. Um, it's not about the capability of a person. And uh, in my experience, you know, uh, what I've seen is that the leaders were more often than not very receptive of it. And uh, they were very thankful for the feedback because they didn't know a few of the things uh, that it was causing thrash. So please don't be afraid for asking for help. Uh, Very often as PMs, we think that we must solve everything on our own, but we don't have to. So uh, obviously this is incredibly hard, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, we'll have uh, high performing teams all the time. Um, The journey is also not that straightforward, right? Like uh, there are, you know, going to be ups and downs. So based on my experience on the problems that I face, there are a few things that you can try to make the journey a little bit smoother. You will still have challenges. It's not as smooth, but you can make it smoother. The first one is uh, get certain key stakeholders on board. Um, In my case, it was the engineering manager. It could be a design manager in your case or someone else. Uh, But typically engineering in the area of work that I am in, engineering is the largest set of people. So it was was very important that the engineering manager and I are uh, on board with whatever we are trying to do. Um, You will get a lot of questions and pushback, uh, obviously, because you are asking people to try new things. Uh, You are in some ways adding a little bit more work to their day to day. Um, So there is just going to be a little bit of pushback. And so you should be prepared and patiently explaining every single time why we are doing it. And as over time, as they see the impact of this, um, they will themselves be bought into it. Um, As a PM, you have to let go of ego and territory. I cannot emphasize this enough. You have to delegate and then you have to give the runway to people to operate. Uh, You can't be territorial about it. You can't micromanage. Uh, And then be open to feedback because that will help you course correct, which is my second point. So you should always, uh, you know, think about um, the outcome that you want, but you don't have a single path to get there. So just focus on improving the quality of your inputs and processes to achieve that outcome. Don't be so fixated on the outcome and the path to get there. Um, So if you just focus on, okay, I am going to get to this outcome, but I understand that you know my inputs may be crappy or the way I was thinking of doing it is probably not the only way and there is a better way that works for the team. Then focus on improving that instead of trying to change the output or the outcome uh, and ending up in a compromise uh, that you don't like. Uh, lastly, I would say, you know, be very kind and patient, both with yourself and with the team. You are changing behaviors, you are building cultures, growth is painful. And uh, a lot of these things that are written here, they're easy to say rather than to actually do. So be patient and be kind to yourself as well as to the team. And don't give in to the doubt. Um, This take, you know, all of this is very slow process. You don't build such teams in a month or even in three months or six months. And it's a constant thing that you need to keep on improving. So you'll start seeing differences. Uh, Just be patient about it. Um, So as a recap, uh, you know, create a shared purpose. Everything starts with, with the goal and the clarity of goals. Create a sense of belonging and a sense of worth. This is the biggest piece of it. Um, Be continuously looking for improvements. Be critical of yourself. Um, Engage and course correct. And be kind and patient to yourself. So this brings us to the close of the presentation. Thank you for watching uh, um, and thank you for listening to me. Um, In case if you need to reach me, Uh, For any further questions, you can always reach me on LinkedIn. This is my profile on LinkedIn. Feel free to message me here. And I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.